Hello and welcome to a brand new series called Carp Fishing Rewind. Now this series is effectively going to be like a carp fishing budget version of Match of the Day. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch a session with our consultants as it unfolds. So you're going to see all of the highs and lows of the session and then afterwards we're going to analyse exactly what happened in that session, the decisions that were made, why they, they were made and, um, and what the outcome of those decisions were. So on this episode, this first episode, we have none other than Mr. Carpy himself, one of my acquaintances, Mark Pitchers, and he has been down to Westmore Farm on Jackie's Pool, and this is how we got on. So here we are at Westmore Farm Fishery in Lincolnshire and this is Jackie's Pool. This is a beautiful little pool of around two acres in size and it's split into two main bodies of water that are connected by a small narrow channel underneath this bridge. And already just as I'm stood here, I'm thinking there's going to be quite a few stalking opportunities. That's how I see this session developing. So what I want to do right now is whip off the Ray-Bans, get on some proper Polaroids, bait a few spots, and let's see if we can't find a fish or two. Well, I've just put together a little mix of pellets and a few boilies and a nice glug of liquid. And I was gonna go on the lake and bait a few spots, but while I was putting that little mix together, I noticed a fish fizzing away right in front of the van just along this margin here, really close to the bank. Just watching it again now. So I'm just knocking up a, a really simple pop-up rig. And I'm gonna go around there, lower this in place right by that fizz of bubbles. Because this is too good of an opportunity to miss really. So hopefully you can get this rig in place without spooking it and get off the mark really early doors. Well, I give that spot about 15 minutes where I lowered that rig right alongside where that fish was, was fizzing away, but nothing's happened. So instead, I've done a lap of the lake. I've baited four or five areas that I, I quite fancy the look of. And I have seen a few fish as well on my, on my lap. So I'm just gonna let those spots work their magic, let the fish feed away, build up their confidence, and right now I'm just going to tie up a couple more rigs. By the time I've done this, hopefully those fish will have uh, gained enough confidence to be uh, a bit easier to catch than that one that seemed to do the disappearing act a few moments ago. out the spots that I baited and there was only one area that looked like it had been fed on to me 
and that's here in this narrow gap between the island. There's a little bit of coloured water here, a few little bubbles coming up and I did see a fish boil on the surface as well. So I've just dropped in a, a single hook bait, a single pop-up over where I'd already pre-baited. I didn't feel like there was any need to introduce any more bait. I had one liner already. I've just got the rod just laid on the ground next to me. Line's just knocked again. There's definitely fish there. I thought I'd have had one by now. Fish just boiled right in the edge down there. fish in the area but they're definitely not feeding with any sort of gusto they're not heads down tails up ripping the bottom up I only put in a few pellets and boilies but yeah they're certainly not getting on it so I've just popped back to the van I've got my PVA bag mix bucket here just tying up a few small mesh bags just to add a little bit more of attraction around the hook bait because like I said, the fish are just having a little mouthful of food. And the idea is just to present a, a nice little trap with a bright hook bait and a little, a little, little nugget of food next to it, like that. Hopefully just enough to provoke or entice a bite. Well, that didn't really pan out how I was expecting. I've been here about 20 minutes. Uh, just had a, a big line where a fish swam into the line right by the rod tips. That dragged the lead, spooked, and um, I feel it may have spooked any other fish that were in the area. So I'm going to uh, carry on having a lap of the lake. Hopefully, there's fish feeding in a few other areas and we can uh, finally get a fish on the bank. Well, the baiting spots and stalking hasn't paid off at all, so I need a change of tactics. So what I'm going to do now, I am going to position two rods to the left of the swim here, where I have seen fish. Not feeding fish, but I have seen fish. And how I'm going to position these rods, I'm going to do the washing line rig. I have two rods rigged up, ready to go. I've changed the hook baits over from the washed out pink to yellow pop-ups now. Still the same mesh bags, but I'm going to walk around and drop them in position. Let's go and do that now.
Well, the rods are in the water and the washing lines have been hung. And if I'm honest, I'm probably more optimistic than I am confident going into tonight. I've seen fish in the area. In fact, I've seen probably more fish where I'm fishing right now than I have anywhere else on the lake. So that's going to be one good thing. And right now I'm just chilling by the fire with a cider and hopefully at some point during the night, they'll see me with a big fat carp. What's a fish? Yeah, that's, that's on me, I think. Well, good morning. I was just sat by the rods, kind of with my head in my hands a little bit, thinking, why haven't I caught anything? Why? And then suddenly, one of the bobbins hit the deck, and uh, it's one of the washing line rods that has gone. I've got a really pretty little fish here. Come on, what are you doing? I've had to just move a little bit away from the swim. He tries to go round, round the island, so I've had to move round here just to get him back out into open water. That's a really pretty fish. Scales on that. Come on. Yes, we've got him. Oh, oh, oh relief. Oh, and what a carp that is. Look at that. Oh, that looks fantastic. Right, let's bring him over to the swim. We'll get the mat out and we'll have a closer look at him. What a way to start the day. Look at that for a car. That's absolutely spectacular. What an awesome looking scaly fish that is. Probably around probably about 17 pounds. Very proud looking fish holding up his dorsal like that. Fair play, sir. I like that. That's, uh, that looks very impressive. But yeah, the washing line rig did the trick. Again, devastating tactic. Really is. I'm absolutely made up with this fish. You ready? Yay! Well, I think that fish will have upsetted that spot for a bit. It's only shallow, that was in about 18 inches of water but I do feel like them fish will creep back in. And I think there's a very good chance of getting another fish or two, dare I say it, today from that spot. So I'm just gonna get a 
new rig on this rod, have a really quick celebratory brew and get it back out there. Well, it's the same rod yet again. The washing line rig. Just had to come down the bank. The fish has tried to go round this island here. Just had to walk a little way down the bank just to bring him back round. Stop the line getting caught up on those, on those branches. This one's really pulling. Look at it zooming around in that shallow water. It's going mental. Such an explosive take that in that shallow water. I'm only fishing in 18 inches, just, just a few feet from the bank. Fish picks up the rig and it's got that little bit of slack line before it hits the clip that's on the bobbin. And that in, that in itself acts as a great, uh, a great aid into hooking the fish. And then they just erupt on the surface. Twenty-two thirteen. Oh, I don't know. Twenty-four nine. Well, it's been surprisingly tough going this session. So to have caught two fish this morning, including this twenty-four pounder, I am really, really pleased with that little result. And once again, this came to the, the washing line rig. It really is a, a devastating tactic in the right situations. And there's still time. There's one more bite, I think. I'd love to finish on a hat trick. Well, I've just slipped that fish back and it did cause quite a lot of disturbance to the swim, actually. It was tearing around, crashing all over the place. And in that shallow water, I think it will have upset any fish that are in the area. So I've just put in a little bit of bait and I'm just going to let that area settle for a bit before I put a rod back out there. Um, but what I'm going to do now, I have another rod rigged up and I have already pre-baited a few spots around the lake. So I'm going to wander around now, check out the other spots. Hopefully I can find fish feeding and hopefully we can put just one more on the bank before it's time to call it a day.
Well, I just slipped back that fish that we caught on the washing line rig. And feeling like that swim may have been disturbed a little bit, I decided to have a walk around the lake. And I noticed just some cloudy water near one of these little bridges where this little cut through is. The rod was in the water a minute, if that. <laughs> and it's ripped off. Fish has tried to get underneath the bridge here. It's covered in weed, blanket weed. I'm just trying to draw him <coughs> for a better fly. For a better fly mid battle. I'm just trying to draw him back through. He's, he went on a mad crazy run initially. He went right underneath the bridge. He's covered in weed, blanket weed. But he's coming back through now. That was a real opportunist moment, that. I didn't know if that coloured water was because of the ducks or whether it was fish. I couldn't see any tail patterns or fizzes, just a patch of coloured water. And yeah, sure enough, it was, it was a fish feeding. Well, we've got him my side of the bridge now anyway. Really angry fish. Come on, then. Come on, in you go. Well, where he is now isn't too far away from where I actually hooked him. Yeah, that'll do. That's the hat trick, anyway. Just want one more now. Well, that's the third fish now for this session, a fish of around 16, 17 pounds. And this fell to a different presentation. This was on a, a bottom bait setup um, that was stalked from the margin in a little bit of coloured water while I left the, the main productive area rest after catching, catching those two fish this morning. Yeah, really happy with that one. And it's always nice when a change of tactics produces that bonus fish. It's easier. Can you see her? So there's just over an hour of this session remaining. So plenty of time to catch just one more. And I'm gonna put the washing line rod back in place. Um, seen any more fish around here if I'm honest I have baited it and I've let it settle for about half an hour um, yeah, I've not seen any more fish around this area but then I haven't really seen anything anywhere else on the lake apart from that one fish that I saw clouding up which I was able to stalk out but yeah I'm gonna get this rod back in place it's a nice shallow area where I'm fishing so in the conditions that we've got really warm temperatures I do feel like this will be my best chance of a bite. I need another rod in place, but I don't know where. Well, that's it for my 24 hours at Jackie's Pole, and this has been a really tough session, much tougher than I thought it was going to be. So to finish with three fish to mid twenties, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. So now it's over to Harry and I in the studio.
Thank you in session, Mark, and welcome in studio, Mark. Thank you. It is genuinely good to have you on. Thank you. Genuinely. <laughs> no, seriously, <laughs> it is good. Uh, one, as one of my best mates, and two, as one of our best love consultants to be on the first episode of Carp I feel very honoured to be your first guest. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And firstly, well done on the session. You got there in the end. Yeah, this was much harder than I thought it was going to be. Much harder. Yeah, I think w when you had sort of set up uh, going to this, this venue, uh -huh. I think we all thought, Kieran as well, behind the camera, thought it's going to be a bit bobbins and and you're going to smash it. Yeah. But it wasn't like that. And Not I think that's a all. good thing because there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it certainly didn't. The session didn't go how I was expecting at all, at all. But I'm quite glad in a way. I'm glad it was hard work. Yeah, it's, that's the thing. When, when you work hard for your fish, they mean so much more than yeah. if you just start straight away and you're catching from the off. Like everybody loves those sessions, but if you work a bit harder and then get the results at the end, it just means a little bit more. Yeah, I think so. So let's start off with um, Jackie's Pool. Just talk us a little bit about what the venue is, how it's sort of set up, whether it's a day ticket, syndicate, that sort of thing. Yeah, so it's a fairly small pool. I think it's probably under two acres in size and it's going to be opening as an exclusive venue where um, either a group of friends or a family can book the lake and the lodge to stay there as well. Uh, the lake's only been completed, I think it's only been dug just over a year ago, although you'd never think it to look at it. It's so mature already. Yeah, I was, I was so surprised. Normally when you've got a really recently dug lake, they do look like your hole in the ground yeah. type thing. And actually it's really mature. Even like the islands are all sort of grown yeah, up. Yeah, and there's been a lot of hard work gone into that. I know from a, as a fishery owner myself, I know how much hard work Lee must have put in to make it look like it does in such, such a short space of time. Yeah, and the lodge. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? Pretty I incredible. There. I could live there quite yeah. happily. Yeah. Not a bad bivvy. <laughs> yeah. Not a bad upgrade from a super brolly. Yeah. But there's some amazing fish in there as well. I think there's about 60, 20 pounders in the pool at the right yeah. time of year. Um, but yeah, there's a good stock of fish. Um, perhaps I wrongly thought they would be rather naive and really easy to catch. We'll talk about that, I'm guessing. Yeah, we go on. yeah we'll, 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 we'll get on to that um, now, I okay. think. <laughs> we might yeah. as well get straight into it. So you've gone off stalking. Yeah. Straight away, off the bat, you've gone off stalking. So firstly, why did you decide to go off stalking rather than set up sort of stall? Well, it was a, a, a warm day. I mean, temperatures we had were sort of high high 20s. Um, I've been told that the margins were fairly shallow and the rest of the lake, there was like a, a, from what Lee had told me, the fishery owner, there was a marginal shelf and then it dropped off into deeper water. Um, with the temperatures being as they were, that they weren't going to be in that deep water. Or if they were, they were going to be high up in the layers and zigs aren't allowed on the fishery. So it made sense to fish in the shallow water, in the margins. So I pre-baited a few areas. So how, how deep were the margins compared to the, the sort of centre of the were lake? Generally, um, I found two to three feet, yeah. whereas the um, open water was down to 11 feet. In okay, places. and you had like, what was it like 25, 20, 26 degrees? Yeah, mid 20s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. they're going to be up in those. Of in course, those. yeah. Although the visibility is, is not good at all. It's a well-coloured pole. You only had around a foot of visibility and you weren't seeing that many fish at all. No. It was really hard to spot them, really hard. Yeah. So and I think one of the things that people are probably going to um, mention when they see um, maybe sponsored anglers, consultants fishing on venues that don't have any, any other anglers on and they go, oh, it's all right for you. you can, you've got the whole lake to yourself, um, so you can go off and do this stalking. Um, that would be like a real fishing situation on this venue, wouldn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. Anyone who books the lodge will be able to fish it exactly the same way that I have, yeah. Yeah, so you'd book it as 
you and and the missus and your kids or you and maybe one other angler yeah. to share the lodge yeah. so actually all of the fishing that you did is what anybody could do if yeah, they booked totally, yeah. a venue like that or i know you like a lot of these smaller exclusive booking venues for that reason yeah i, I like smaller venues in general really i i, I think it's because i grew up fishing small yorkshire farm ponds i mean i own a small fishery myself that's kind of what i feel most comfortable doing and yeah there's, there's something a, about them it's well obviously i do like going on big expanses of water as well something about that small up close and personal sort of feel i don't know i just yeah i feel so at home fishing them type of waters do you think it's because the fishing's a bit more technical you probably have to be i don't know a little bit more in tune with 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 the technical aspects because the fish are never that far away I, actually getting them to pick up I a rig is think different there's less room or less margin for error on smaller venues as there are on bigger venues yeah and um what i tell a lot of people who, who come to my water is because those fish are unable to escape pressure on a big water you can spook them they'll move away but they may be catchable elsewhere but if you spook fish on a smaller venue there's only so much they can take before they just switch off and that's it yeah that's their defense mechanism if you like they can't escape pressure their defenses will just don't we won't feed okay and so talking about that margin for error yeah you didn't catch anything for the whole of that first day yeah why um i just think those fish just weren't feeding with enough conviction to to sort of get those quick bites. I expected to bait those spots in the shallow water, go around, check and see tail patterns and muddy water. And I, and I thought it'd be a case of, yep, that spot, lower it in, catch one. That's what I thought it'd be like, no, nope, nothing. I didn't see any signs of anything feeding at all. I thought maybe it's just because the water's that colored that I can't see them. So I did try the spots. I wasn't getting liners, knocks, nothing. And I was just lowering a rig in a nice slack line. If fish had have been there, you'd have known about it and the fish just weren't responding to the bait they just weren't they just i think it was because the fish had fairly recently spawned and it is a strange time of year um it can go kind of one or two ways although it, it's more often than not this way and that's after the spawn it is it's a stressful time it's a stressful period and it, it can shake them up and they can go off the feed a lot of people think the spawn and they want to get straight back on the feed yeah it's often don't. it's often a, a couple of weeks yeah. that they have where it's just yeah. sort of chilling out yeah um just, just recovering and yeah, yeah yeah so you've so you've baited these spots with with pellet and boilie yeah so why did you choose pellet and boilie to start off with so like i said at the start these fish are fairly new naive and they have been fed a lot on pellet yeah so yeah that was my reason for using the pellet you know that the, these fish only a couple of years ago will have been in uh lee's stock pond and then they'll have been fed on pellet raised on pellet transferred into this lake and i assume lee has been feeding them on pellet as well yeah so it made sense so to, to do pellet that. is like blood worm to a stocky yeah yeah <laughs> It's their natural food, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I, I fully expected them to get straight on it. I can't believe that you didn't catch that early, I, early I on. I couldn't it, believe it. But like you said, that sort of funny post-spawning yeah. period where they're not quite on it, something needs to, I don't know, change yeah. for you to start getting the bites. Yeah, I think. yeah, yeah. The stalking hasn't really worked out. Uh -huh. The boiling pellets haven't really worked out. So your plan going into the next night was to sort of set up camp, not that you needed to do that yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> because you had the lodge and you put out, was it a, a washing line and then a couple? Uh, yeah, so one of the spots where I had been stalking fish was um, around the back of an island. The water was only shallow, about 18 inches deep. And there was fish visiting, and because it was so shallow there, I, I could I could see them. I could generally see them as they were disturbing the, the bottom, not by feeding, just by their, their movements. So although there was fish there, they weren't sort of getting their heads down on the bait. They, yeah. they just 
if there were, it was literally a quick mouthful and then yeah. moving off. So it was when I saw that that I thought the, the stalking just isn't going to work. And that's what I thought I need to sort of bait a spot, a set a trap and wait. And wait it out, yeah. yeah. So um, the best way I felt uh, of doing this was to fish in the same area I had trying to, try, was trying to stalk a fish from, but set a trap and I did so with a, a washing line rig. Yeah. The, the spot was only probably um, five, six feet from the bank. And that, that's, that is sort of perfect washing line territory, isn't yeah. it, really? Yeah, so that washing line, we both use that tactic when when we can. When the mm -hmm. when the situation suits, it's not and not every situation yeah. suits it. But it is deadly, just that line not being in the water, um, sort of out to the spot. Just it's like is, the ultimate line concealment, isn't it? Let's face it. Yeah, it's, and it is, I th we've all seen it before, fish, Fish do spook offline. Yeah. That is probably the thing that they're the most scared of. I, d I don't believe that they can see your rig or anything like that, especially with m sort of modern day, how well we can camouflage everything. But if they can feel your line, yeah, that is scary to them. Definitely, yeah. if it brushes against the fins, the flanks, the face, yeah, that, that's, yeah that's what spooks them more than anything, I think. Okay, so firstly, I've got a bit of apparatus for... Uh -huh us to see exactly how you set up your washing line yep. um, rig. So um, yeah, I've got, this isn't exactly what you used, but that's more or less. Yep, pretty your, much the same, yeah. So it's a, we've got a bank stick, um, something to hold in a hockey stick, which I've got a butt rest, and then the hockey stick with a slick bobbin. I think you used a stealth bobbin. Yeah, just a smaller version of that the important thing is is the head on them it has to be able to trap the line in place so it can't run freely it has to be able to trap the line in place yeah so on these on these stealth uh or on the stealth and the slick bobbins you've got a ball clip and then if you go further into there there's a grip and that grips the line and you can alter the tension on that grip with this collar you just tighten it up or loosen it depending on how thick your line is. So if I give you that, uh -huh. I might need to hold it in place. Right, this is your rig. Yeah. So what so how do you put it into the like how do you set it up when you're dropping it in? Okay. So I think first of all, there's the sort of two ways of getting the rig to here. Um now where I was, it was the, the banker's fairly flat, there wasn't lots of bushes and things in the way, so I was just able to walk around with the rod yep. above my spot and have a little bit of a feel around with the rod to try and find the cleanest, firmest area there. There was actually quite a lot of uh, blanket weed on the bottom, right? Um, so I was able to have a little feel around, find the, the, the firmest bit, the bit that perhaps was cleaner because it had been fed on, I don't know. So I found a, a nice place to present the rig, lowering it down, and then just slackened off the line. So this would be going back, I'd be sort of stood where I am now. That would be the rig in the water. And then I'd peel off enough. Do you want me to hold that there? Thank you. So I'd peel off enough slack line here. So all that would be pinned down on the deck. And because you're only fishing a few feet from the bank, you can leave this nice and slack. It's not going to affect the, the bite indication because it's the fish is only going to run in one direction and that's away, it's not going to run towards the bank, well, it's only going to run a couple of feet. So we then put the line in the clip, but all the way into the, the grip at the bottom so the line can't travel through it. And then this would be going back to, so I'd probably be fishing from over that way. Right, give it to me. <laughs> so I'll be your rod. Yep, yeah, you're the rod, going back to the swim. So you then tighten up yeah. to the bobbin. Yeah. So the bobbin's up like that. You're fishing, you're, you're bobbing on your alarms right at the top. By the top, heavy bobbin. Crank it really tight, not tight enough so it pulls it out of the, the clip. If it pulls it out of the clip, you'll be into the, the, the ball clip. And then the line can travel, and then you'll have a tight line going down to your rig, which would defeat the object yeah. entirely. So this needs to be nice and slack, so it's pinned down out of harm's way in the grip. Like I said, the good thing with that grip is you can tighten it right up yeah, you can to, the, really to the line. With the collar, yeah. 
So this, this line back to your rod is right the way across the surface. There's no way that any fish are going to, ever going to come into contact with that. And then when you get a bite, what happens? When you get a bite, it'll pull it out of that clip. I'll leave it, well, generally the takes were getting there because it was such shallow water, 18 inches. It would pull it out the clip and you'd see a huge explosion on the surface. Yeah, yeah. It was really explosive uh, takes. So yeah, that'll pull it out of the clip and then it would just be a drop back. Because yep. using a heavy bob in a tight line, the bobbin just hits the deck. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, I love fishing this way. If um, if any of you who are watching this watched the session uh, that we filmed at Old Mill, mm. uh, you'll remember I caught a fish called Pictures, which yeah. was a 50 pounder, my PB, 51 pounds, and that was caught using this exact this exact method in a quiet little corner. Um, so now, firstly, a lot of people will say, um, like, especially when you do it when you're casting over and then walking, uh, dropping it in and then walking back, a lot of people will say that you're off your rods. If you do that, you're off your rods and you're fishing dangerously. Do you believe that that's the case? Not, not at all. I mean, in reality, how long is it, are you going to wait before you get a bite? By the time you watch, you're not going to be getting a bite within seconds of placing well, that rig. I mean, it could happen, couldn't it? Let's face it. It could happen, but lots of things could happen. Yeah, the ch I think, the ch firstly, the chances of it happening, of you having just stood over that margin exactly. spot, and dropping it, yeah. those chances are very, very slim. And secondly, you can't fish this method over long distances. No, it doesn't. It doesn't work. Your line won't stay up. Yeah, that's it'll true. bow out. It'll yeah. pull out of your clip or whatever people use an elastic band. It'll pull out of it because of the tension of the line. Yeah. What can you fish these? Probably a maximum of about forty yards. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe less than that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the sort of range of fishing it, aren't you, really? So it's not, it'll, it would take you the same amount of time to get back to your rods there as what it does for people to unzip their sleeping bag, unzip their bivvy door down, wake up yeah. in, in the night. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I, I, I've, I've never seen it as a dangerous method to fish. I, I, there's lots of what ifs in, in carp fishing and there's lots of what ifs in life. That's not how I not how I work. Okay, so what if <laughs> <laughs> what if a duck swims into it? Mm. What if it doesn't? What if a swan swims into it? But what if it doesn't? But seriously, what if it does? But what if it doesn't? <laughs> I think <laughs> these are questions that come up an awful lot on our social media and, and basically anyone who covers the washing line as a tactic and it's just another sort of obstacle that you've got to get over if a if a duck swims into it it pulls it out the clip and your presentation's ruined in a similar way to if a bream picks you up if a duck dives and picks up your hook bait you've got to reset yeah. it so yeah, if you're fishing on like a busy park lake where you've got loads and loads of ducks and stuff like that, yeah. it's probably not the best thing to exactly, do. In the yeah. same way that if you're fishing a lake with loads of bream, you're probably best not fishing sweet corn and maggots. Yeah. I also, well, I've found actually, I have had ducks swim into the line, but what normally happens is they pull it out with a grip at the bottom and the line is still in the actual, the ball clip. So yeah. it's still there. It just means you have to walk around peel off a little bit of slack and then reset the line. So you're not having to reset the whole rig all over again. Yeah, yeah. So it's so it, not really... It's it's one of those things that can happen, but it's like a lot of other things can interrupt your carp fishing and it's just something that you've got to get around. I know that, that session at Old Mill, I fished with a washing line for three days, three nights, and I had a duck take me out once. And I was quite happy to replace that in the clip for the fact that I was fishing for, for loads of really nice fish. So yeah. it's a, it is a devastating method. And that morning you caught. Yes, I did. Yeah, and it was, it was that rod. It was that same, yeah, that, that rod where I had actually tried stalking. So if I'd have been waiting there, stalking, I'd have been waiting 10 hours, I think, for that, that <laughs> bite. <laughs> That's yeah. how long it, it, it took. 
So yeah, it was quite clear that the uh, stalking was not the one and the sort of bait and weight was the best approach. Yeah. And so also on that rod, so you've, 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 that you've caught on, you did change a bit because you were using um, pellet and boilie, yeah. like we said, but you've just put sweet corn on that rod. Yeah, my reason for changing over to the corn was when I saw the fish clearly weren't feeding with a great deal of, of, of gusto. I just find the corn is a better approach. It's a lot less, it's much easier to digest. It's an easier sort of mouthful of food to eat. Yeah. It's just, they eat it in and it just goes, it, 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 <laughs> it Yeah, it's, I don't know, whatever it is, 80, 90% water. Yeah. Whereas obviously a pellet has a has a lot higher sort of food content. Yes. Fills them up a bit quicker. So if they're not really on it, I've definitely found that literally just like a pinch or a couple yeah, of handfuls, handfuls of corn, of, of or corn yeah. for some reason just switches them on yeah. enough for you to get a bite. It's almost like a scratching tactic and almost like a scratching bait, isn't it? Like a handful of corn to get a quick bite or something. There's something about it, I don't yeah. know. And so that's why I made that change. And uh, I had been fishing with washed out pink pop-ups. I uh, changed over to using yellows over the top. Is it wonders. get you out of jail yeah, tactics, isn't definitely, it? Definitely, yeah. So rig-wise, what you put over the top was, um, you've actually tied one up for us here. Yeah. Um, so you've got a um, really basic pop-up rig. Now that is no Ronnie rig, that's for sure. That's no, <laughs> I, well, I have never cast a runny rig out in my life, really. But like this is this is pretty much as basic as a yeah. pop up rig can get. Now we at the moment there's definitely definitely lots of people use a runny rig, and lots of people are wanting things to kick that eye over and to be a flipper or a turner or or whatever uh -huh. to get that sort of bottom lip hook holds that's what everyone's talking about and trying to achieve that's like the opposite i gonna say i have a completely different sort of mentality don't i really with with this i just want that gape to be as wide as possible that's a philosophy i always stand by <laughs> like and, and 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 i apply that in my fishing as well as, <laughs> as, well as the rest of my very very good yeah yeah so, yeah, with this, you can see, um, yeah, I mean, although it is basic, I mean, it's so basic, that's not to say there's no thought gone into mm. the mechanics and, and things like mm. that. So you've got, um, that's Camatex Soft? Yeah, Camatex Soft in £20. Yeah. Um, just a split shot to balance the pop-up. The hook is actually a uh, stiff rig beaked hook with the outturned eye. Now... Ordinarily, a lot of these rigs you see have, have some shrink tube and uh, they'll bend it uh, inwards to create a really aggressive angle. But for me, that just narrows the gape, meaning there's less chance of that hook catching hold. It gives it, there's less hook yeah. to actually yeah, yeah, catch a hold totally. in the mouth. And the hook itself is fairly big in comparison to the size of the hook bait. It's a yeah. size 5. I think this is only a 12 mil pop-up and you know, traditionally myself included back in the day would probably use like a size 8 hook or something with, yeah, a, yeah. with a 12 mil pop up this is the size 5 and yeah it's a big piece of metal a big wide gape and when that goes in there's lots of hooks to catch hold yeah okay so in true Keith Arthur tight lines fashion we've got the tank that we couldn't bring over in real time like they did on tight lines because it is so heavy <laughs> um, but I've got Mark's rig here and we're going to see how it how it sort of sits, um, and I mean, there's really not a lot to say about about this. This nicely balanced yep. sort of goes down. We'll just show you that again. Goes down not really, really slowly, but again, not not like a brick. Yeah, Is, it's it's more buoyant than a lot of the free offerings that there was. East, I would think. Yeah. So you're you don't you're not too worried about it being like sinking an inch a minute. Yeah, I've never I've never really liked that. I've always been concerned that any fish feeding around it that that hook bait can waft up if it is too too balanced like that. 
yeah. I want it to sink slowly. I want it to require very little effort to actually suck up for it to be lighter than what, uh, what else it's eating on the lake bed. And I mean, I think that's that kind of how probably, is. without having some sweet corn here to test it against, is probably similar yeah. to what a grain of exactly, sweet corn yeah. would, would sink like. So I guess you're just trying to trying to mimic that. And so with the, the Camatex Soft, obviously we haven't got a, a lead attached here. Does it sit out as, as sort of pin straight as that on the bottom or is it is there a slight curve in it? It or would what? sit like that because it, it is a coated braid. Yes, it is a soft coated braid, uh, but it has still got a coating. And because the hook bait is slow sinking, yeah, it's not critically, critically balanced, but it's sinking slow enough and there's enough stiffness there for it to push the hook bait away from the lead, the lead clip, and still fall flat like it is now. Yeah, but I guess the, I guess the good thing with this, if that was if that was stiff, and say a fish was coming from this angle with a stiff hook bait, if it was sucking from here, imagine my just imagine my hand there is a carp. <laughs> I'm imagining it. Yeah, that hook bait isn't gonna isn't yeah. going to fly back on a stiff hook link. That's it. There's still enough sort of flexibility there for it to be able to move. With this, it's going to yeah. it's going to curve backwards if a yeah. fish comes from from that that direction. So, yeah, and is is that kind of the reason that you use a soft hook link? Is it for the maneuverability? That's, that's one of the reasons. Yes, and also because um, should that hook link fall over any sort of debris litter on the lake bed, a stiff hook link can cause that to sit up and not actually be popped up off the bottom. It can sometimes sit a little bit off the bottom because it is so stiff. Yeah. And yeah, with a, with a soft coated hook link like that, should that fall over anything, it still kind of follow that contours and still be popped up off the bottom. Because if that landed over a, a, a twig or something, then your pop-up could actually sort of be popped up from like off off the lake bed, if you get yeah. my drift. So, and so that rod that you fished with um, that rig over the sweet corn produced you two fish, didn't it? Yeah. So the first bite was an upper double, and it wasn't that long after I repositioned that rod and rebaited it that it went away again. And this was a, a bigger fish this time. Yeah. And that was yeah twenty four nine, I think it was. So yeah, really nice fish. I was I was really happy with that. So I'll just rewind slightly. That first day and first night, you've not caught anything. But then day two, you've caught three in, in relatively quick succession. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that day two was better than day one and the night? I wasn't that, I don't know, you kind of get a, a feeling as to when you're going to catch at night and not, whether it's a sixth sense or what, I don't know. Maybe it's because I was fishing in really shallow water, 18 inches, but it just, for me, it just felt more day bitey anyway. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. But um, yeah, I, I kind of already written off the night. <laughs> and if anything had happened, it would have been Written off. Bonus. Shut the patio doors. <laughs> yeah, football <laughs> on. Football. Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, I I did expect it to be first light morning. Um, I mean, when when we actually arrived at the, the the lake and got the rods in the water, that wasn't until the middle of the afternoon. We didn't start in the morning. No, it was kind of the middle of the afternoon. So we are arriving, setting up, trying to catch fish in the heat of the day. Yeah, temperatures high 20. It's not exactly the best time of day, but saying that, I did expect to catch fish in the evening. Yeah. And that didn't really happen. But again, I think once I sort of figured out that stalking, chasing them around wasn't the one and setting little traps was, then I think that's probably why I caught them fish yeah. in fairly quick succession. So this rod produced two fish. Brilliant, we love this rod, great. You had a, two other rods fishing that night and into the morning. What happened with those? What, one, what did you do with them and why didn't they work like this one did? So I had another rod being fished on a washing line rig. It wasn't quite in the same zone. It was almost like a, 
almost like a, a backup washing line rig. It was close to where I'd seen fish, but not quite no, on them. Th this one was where was, you'd seen them. That was them. where I'd seen them. This one was, I thought, well, if fish come in from another angle, I may perhaps intercept them. Um, so I was fishing around the back of an island, and I figured any fish sort of moving from the uh, the bridge or the, the other other part of the lake, then it'd be a good chance to intercept them on this rod that did did the damage. Fish approaching from the other way, if that's it, how they were indeed coming round, then the other rod could maybe nick them. But I hadn't really seen that many fish in that area. It was more of a a hopeful. Yeah, it, it was sort of in a little bit of a corner. It looked good, so yeah, it was it was hopeful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other rod, well, that's actually right next to where I'd parked the van. They were sheeting up, fizzing up like mad, just going crazy. Right. And there was lots of fizzes coming up. And you're thinking, game on. You're thinking this uh, is. It. I'm thinking. I'm thinking, just walk around, lower rig in. Yeah. It's going to go in, in my hands. <laughs> and nothing. I, ch I just watched them fizzing all over me all evening. Was that, that, because from everything else that we've seen on this session, yeah. that seems way more significant than, than any of the other That was the only things. area where I'd seen them fizzing. I'd not seen anything anywhere else. It was just one area and they were fizzing constantly. To the point where I thought it was there was so much fizzing. I think is it actually fish? Is it I don't know. Is it it's, is there a Alka Seltzer tablet a, at the bottom of the lake? Is, is this is this what is this, is this hot his tub? hot tub? <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculous. Yeah, and um, so I'd had the same rig fished to them fizzing fish all night and nothing. And I couldn't help but think, well, if those fish are really rooting around and fizzing like they are, maybe it's that pop-up, albeit a low one, it's just too high. Them fish are in whatever they're feeding in. Yeah. And I'm fishing on whatever they're feeding in rather than in. Yeah. So um, I had um, that morning rigged up a rod with a bottom bait presentation. And having seen this area of coloured water, I figured if, if it was a fish feeding in a similar fashion, how these other fish have been feeding, then perhaps yeah. a bottom bait so, might so be you're, So you've tied up two different rigs to match how the fish are feeding yeah. in those situations. So one situation, the fish are feeding in the silt, in the bottom, yeah. really rooting about, and you've opted for a bottom bait. Yeah. And then the other situation, you've, you haven't seen them feeding yeah, confidently. That's it. They're not feeding, they're sort of coming in, having a mouthful, moving off. And so that's where you've put bright cook bait, yes. pop up, a few grains of sweet corn. Yeah, that's it. Okay. I think that's that's probably one of the sort of key elements that I've got from this session is is the changing between two different rigs. You could have quite easily continued to put that pop up rig that's worked out to the other spots that, that you've fished and the other situations, but you've changed to a bottom bait because of how you've seen the fish feeding. Yeah, I wish I'd made the change sooner, really. Do on, you think on, it, on, that, on, on that first night? <sighs> yeah, I think, I think I could have nicked one if I'd have changed sooner, in hindsight. The thing is, I, I'm a, I was annoyed with myself because whenever I've gone to, to waters where fish are fizzing like that, I, I, I wouldn't fish a pop-up. I don't know why. So why I, did you? I think, I, I, I'll be honest, I think on this session, I, I, I don't think I was fishing at my most efficient. So just having that lodge probably relaxed you a little bit too much into making potentially the right decision in terms of the fishing, do you think? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, that lodge is absolutely fantastic. and. I'm I'm big enough to admit that I, I wasn't totally in the zone going into that night. During the day, I was pretty much on it. But once we got to, to night time and there was a telly there and the football was on <laughs> and there was cold ciders in the fridge, then, yeah, maybe I kind of... I went, think like anyone would uh, yeah. at that type of that type of venue. These, these venues are getting more and more popular. Um, I know I've 
potentially got one booked out to go with uh, with the missus later later this year, staying in a lodge, fishing lake out, out the back door. You're not going to be 100% on it all the time. And I think that anyone going to these venues are going to be like that. And I think if you want to be 100% on it all the time, you're probably not getting your money's worth when you when you yeah, book the lodge. True. Yeah, that's so true. Okay, so let's take a look at the bottom bait rig. Okay. Well, it's about as complicated as my pop-up rig, really. So again, same hook link material, 20 pound Camatex Soft. This time we have a wide gate beaked point hook, that's a size four. And I have a rig ring there level with the barb to create a blowback effect. And I've just got a Pacific Tuna dumbbell uh, hook bait there. But you've got, on this rig, you've got a shrink tube kicker. Yeah which obviously you don't have on the pop-up rig. So why are you using a kicker on a bottom bait rig and not on your pop-up? Okay, so for me, I, I, I want to retain that wide gape there. So I'm using that, the wide gape. That's actually a wide gape beat X hook, the extra strong. And now the reason for me using the, the shrink tube is I do believe that a long shank hook offers better hooking properties than a short shank yep. hook. Um, but what the long shank hook lacks is strength. So what I've done here is use a short shank hook and artificially increase the length of the shank with the shrink tube. Now, what a lot of people do is they shrink it at this really aggressive angle. I haven't, I've kind of carried on at the same way which the eye exits. So it's just basically an extension of the hook shank almost. So it's not really narrowing the gape at all. So what, I so what is it about like a longer shank hook or extending the hook with the shrink tube that makes it more effective to you at hooking fish than like a shorter shank? So I guess when you look at the shape here with the hook and the shrink tube, it kind of looks a lot like the bent hook rigs that yeah. we used to use in the 90s. Proper which savage. They were, they were great at hooking <laughs> fish, but they did cause damage. Yeah. Um, so by artificially increasing the length of the shank here, you have all the benefits in terms of hooking properties that a bent hook has without causing any mm. damage to the mouth. Okay, what I'm trying to, what I'm really trying to drill down on though is what are those, those benefits? What what is it about that bent hook, that bit that bends over, that makes this th a, a bent hook more effective than a normal hook? So I, I I just think it really helps that hook turn and catch a hold. That's the reason for me doing it. I mean those bent hook rigs back in the day were were lethal. I remember when I first started using them, I, I would fish with a like a, a normal uh, just a normal hair rig presentation on one rod and put a bent hook on another. And the amount of fish that, that that hook caught, that rig caught compared to a standard rig, it, it vastly outnumbered it, vastly. Yeah. So and it's just that that sort of hook. It's almost like a claw, isn't it? It's more like a, like a hook, it's just a claw just waiting just to catch, that looks really aggressive, but, I'm <laughs> doing that. but it's just like a claw just waiting to catch a hold and it does, it just seems to get a, get a, a great grip. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's, Two, actually, when they're both quite simple, they are, in terms of mechanics, very different. But because one's a pop-up and the hook's in a good position yeah, and the wide gate, that helps it catch a hold in that instance. But because this is, is fish on the bottom with a bottom bait, that sort of bent hook style yeah, Works that's better. it. That's the way the way the hook is sat off the bottom, proud. The way the fish is coming in and feeding. I just want a nice wide gape so when the fish sucks it in, often they um, hook themselves when they eject when they know something's not right. They, they've they've sucked in a hook bait, but they've sucked in something else as well. It wasn't it wasn't trying to suck up the hook. It didn't even know the hook was there. It's seen the yellow thing. It sucked that in. Something else is is there that it wants to get rid of. And when it ejects the bait and it's got a nice wide gape, that then catches hold and that's how the fish are, are hooked or initially pricked. But when the, when the hook is laid on the deck and it sucks it in, this, you've got this claw. So when it's ejecting there, you've just got, got a claw, it just seems to just catch hold every time. So yeah, they are different presentations depending on how the hook is, is sat. Yeah, and as we saw 
both worked really, really well. So also, you had a mid twenty. Yeah, that was that was nice. Yeah, really nice. Um, so yeah, I think firstly, well done on your session. You pulled it out of the bag in the end. Thanks. I like how you sort of eventually worked out that you needed to use a bottom bait if it was a little bit late on in the day. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so yeah, well done. What do you think you'd change if you went back? Mm, I wouldn't have wasted so much time stalking when the fish clearly weren't on the feed. I kind of just thought the spots I was fishing were the wrong spots, but I baited enough of them around the lake and didn't see any sort of feeding response. So I should have known then really there was a case of sort of setting little traps and waiting. I would have done that. Um, when those fish were fizzing like they were, I really should have used a bottom base. The fish were clearly feeding in something and yeah, the pop-up, it must have just been, even though I had a really low lying pop-up, lower than what we see in the tank here, yeah, I think it was just too high because the, the, the bubbles, the, the, the sheets, the sheets of bubbles were coming up exactly where my rig was. It must have been like there next to the face all the time. So yeah. I, there, I, it's just been above them and they've been below it. So it was foolish of me not to make the change. It really was. Yeah. Um, so and I think I would uh, use corn kind of just from the outset, really. Yeah. Just corn. Yeah, corn, it's corn yellows, and um, yeah, when those fish are fizzing, probably one of them uh, bottom baits and just a just a little mesh bag or something like that. Yeah, and would you still chill out and relax in the lodge, or would oh, you yeah. bivy up? No, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Mark, thank you very very much. Fist me for the first time. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I think you've been a great guest. I think there's an awful lot for everybody to sort of learn from this, especially um, why the washing line works so well, why um, changing to a bottom bait works in certain situations and why using a pop-up in other situations works really, really well. If you'd have done anything different, please comment below. If you've got any questions for Mark to answer as well, please answer them, uh, put them down in the comments below. Mark's going to be reading the comments on this uh, video and answering all of those. So if you've got anything to ask him or just to tell him well done or not well done, depending on how well you thought he did, do that and yeah, we will be bringing you another episode of Cart Fishing Rewind in the near future.